Well, hello and welcome to video three. This video is cram packed with tips, tricks, and maybe a bag of chips. That's right, I'm pulling out all of the stops for this video and giving you the best of my knowledge to help you make great choices and to start out with success. Learn how to be a penny pincher Bible journaler using first what you have and then what you learn about. Make wise choices about when to spend and invest and when to pass along. We're also going to take time to practice both visualization, hand lettering, and we may even give you a few page starters as well. Then stick around for some advice for making choices about how to take the next step. We'll wrap things up with getting you plugged into our community because we don't want you going anywhere. Now don't get yourselves in a pinch and run out to the store and buy everything you can find. Instead, remember this and you'll always keep yourself grounded and thinking about what's really important. First up is a simple sketchbook. This one here is just blank pages, but you could also use a journal with lines. The nice part about this is that you can really combine everything that we've talked about so far. Bible journaling, faith art. You could also do some of your prayer journal in here and keep everything together. Another option for you might be an old hymnal. A lot of times people connect through music and this is a great way to bring those two things together. Lastly, of course, is our journaling Bible. And of course, there's all sorts of styles of Bibles. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. The next thing you need is something to write with. This could be as simple as a pencil and a pen. I like to use my Sharpie pen, but I also highly recommend if you're just getting started and want to keep things simple, just grab the closest ballpoint you can find. The last ingredient to your creative worship cake is something to color with. Now it could be something as simple as markers or colored pencils that you find laying around or a trusty old set of watercolor paints, depending on what style you're going for. Now to tell you I don't get excited about art supplies, as you could see in that video, would be a lie. I love going shopping and finding new materials that I can use on my faith journey. But it can be a stumbling block. Not only financially, it can also be a block of the heart. It's really important that as much as we love to enjoy and to share supplies and share new finds, it's really important that we always check our hearts. Are we doing this for the right reasons? That's why I say you just need something to write with, something to write in, and something to color with, and you'll be all set to make beautiful creations for God. So you may be asking yourself, Monica, when do I make a good investment? I always say that it's really important to practice or to try out or to watch videos on the supplies you're considering purchasing before you buy them. That's why I encourage you to take part in our online community through Facebook. We do a lot of tutorials and we share a lot of different experiences. We compare products and we talk about how things can be used. You may look at a video and think, I never even considered those things and I have them sitting in the drawer. Or you may see something new and exciting and you just have to try it. So just as this segment suggests, don't let your wallet shed a tear over Bible journaling. It's just not worth it. But when you are ready to make an investment, there's a couple of things I can help you to think about. The first thing to think about is, is this product or is this gizmo or gadget something that I'm going to see myself using for many different varieties of reasons. If you purchase something at a big cost and only use it once or twice, it's really not worth your investment because there's so many different alternatives. But if the product or material or supply looks like something you would see yourself using over and over again, then that's the perfect time to take the plunge and to make the investment. But don't forget, there are all sorts of coupons, especially if you're shopping at a craft store. Be sure to print out coupons and buy your bigger sets with that coupon to get the best bang for your buck. 
It's very tempting sometimes to want the name brand or the best of the best, but I have to tell you, I've often found that sometimes those name brand products don't work as good as the second in line. Be sure to ask friends who are already Bible journaling what products they like. For instance, my teammate Jamie and I have been Bible journaling together for a couple of years. I really love Tombow markers, dual tips. They're used for calligraphy or special hand lettering. It's a water-based marker, so it has multiple purposes. You can paint with it, you can blend colors together, and of course it has a spongy tip to allow you to make really beautiful letters. We love Tombows, but they are very pricey. Jamie recently discovered that an off-brand at one of our local craft stores has a set very similar. They're built the same way, two ends, bright colors, water base, but they have a feeling to them that we absolutely love. It's something about the way that the tip bounces back when you're writing your letters. What do you know? Half the price and even better to use. The last piece of advice I can give you about making an investment is to think about the product itself. A product like Faber-Castell's Gelatos and Ranger's Distress Crayons are very similar in nature. Do your research before you invest in either one. See if you can find a side-by-side -side that states some of the pros or the cons of each product. There is a price difference, although in that particular example, maybe not a huge one, but reading reviews Getting to know those products that are very similar might help you choose the brand that's going to be worth it for your budget. Another area that you want to consider is the quality of products. This is especially true in colored pencils. If there was something I'd want you to invest in, that's what it would be. But colored pencils are my thing. Maybe it's more like paint for you. Pigment is really where price comes into play with those kinds of materials. A low-end childlike colored pencil has a harder lead as for it not to break when the child is pushing on it. The problem with that is that there isn't as, as much pigment. They're harder to blend and the colors aren't going to be as rich. So if you use a product like colored pencils, investing in a high-end brand is worth it. In this segment, we're going to practice some hand lettering because one of the things that I find over and over again that artists and new journalers want to know is how to increase the quality and the look of your lettering. There's some really basic tricks that I like to teach people, whether it's uh, working with their printed handwriting or whether it's their cursive. So let's go ahead and start by adding serifs. So the thing with the letters that are with serifs is that they start out as very basic block letters, or they can, and it's just really the addition of something on the end. So a serif tends to have more of a formal look to it. It could be something as simple as these little lines on the ends. Now, if you wanted to thicken these letters and make them look even more formal, what we would do here is to actually pretend like we were adding in an upside down triangle. And then I'd go over those lines just a little bit more. So again, I'm going to bring lines up to meet to make these little triangles on the ends. And then I would just thicken up the letter with a couple more rounds or overlapping. All right, so you can see how that changes the H in comparison to the other letters. So what kind of fun marks can we add to the ends of letters? We can add something as simple as a dot or a circle. We can even do something that has uh, double layers or a spiral. Same is true for boxes or long rectangular chunks. And even doing things like triangle points or stars or hearts 
are all fun ways to add a little extra flair to your letters. You can also take this serif into a more curved look by adding rounded ends or leaf style ends. Changes it up to be almost an illustrated letter. So let's go ahead and try this with the word the. I'll go ahead and start with my base letter. But this time I'm going to add this kind of blob to the end really loosely and maybe just on parts of like maybe a half serif. So I'm not doing it necessarily on the whole thing, but on some of the letters. I can use that blob to almost dance my letters in a different direction. You can see how dropping those little teardrops in different directions changes up the letter completely. It's a really simple thing to practice with your basic font just by adding a little extra flair to the ends. All right, let's go on to making hollow letters. Now, what is the advantage of making a hollow letter? What I like to remind my journalers is that making a hollow letter means possibilities. When you have an empty space, it means you can fill it with things like lines, designs, or color. So let's go ahead and show you how you can turn pretty much any font and any style of lettering into a hollow letter. I'm going to go ahead and make this a little bit bigger for you to see because I'm using pencil. So I'm going to start with the letter A. Now I'm going to add a little extra flair to this A, making it round and kind of have points that meet in. I'm going to cross this A, but I'm going to come out a little far on one side. Again, just to give a little extra pizzazz. Now the trick with any hollow letter is to start with a basic sketch like you have seen here. But now the trick is to trace around the letter all sides, including the spaces that are hollow in between. You can see I've got half of it traced and now I'm going back over the other way until I've made a complete round about the outside. Now don't forget these hollow spaces. These have to be covered too. But once you've done that, you can erase what's left in the middle and you have now the potential of filling this letter with color, design, pattern, or really anything you can think of. This is great to use uh, this technique when you have a word on your Bible page that you really want to add emphasis to. I just did a, a page like this on Facebook that was um, arise. I used the word arise and I used this kind of a font which has a little bit of, I don't know, I feel like it's a little bit whimsical. And then I chose to use three colors uh, to fade in kind of an ombre effect. This is a simple technique that I use often. I think it's just a really fun, um, just a subtle way to add a little bit of detail that makes you look like an expert. So I'm going to add a little bit of my lightest color first. And one of the tricks that I have for you is uh, coloring. When you're coloring, even though it might look, because I'm coloring pretty quickly, like I'm using straight lines, you really want to try to be small circles. This helps with blending and to avoid uh, rough edges. Now I'll take my next color here, which is more of a, a peachy orange, and I'll overlap where I want it to blend just slightly and then bring it up just slightly further than what I imagine I want the, my third color uh, to start. There we go and I'll fill this in and I'll just go ahead and continue with my third color here. I would then add in my third color by overlapping and finishing it off to the top. Now you can imagine just using your black pen. Maybe I'll do another example for us here. So you can see doing your black pen with just a simple block letter. But then doing what we call Zen Doodle or line art where we just add in extra 
designs or textures with our pen. This gives you another way to just highlight and emphasize whatever the word or the letter is that you want to. Even something as simple as little polka dots gives a small amount of texture and makes a big difference. The last thing I want to show you with block letters is how to shade. Now, when we shade, we want to stick with this principle. I'm going to draw the letter H for you here to show you what I mean. If we were to draw a box around this letter, the box would have a top, a bottom, a right, and a left. So when we're shading, what we want to keep in mind is that we have the choice of four different combinations, depending on which way we want our letter to pop out. All you have to do is choose one of those four combinations and add color to two of the sides of your letter. I'm going to go ahead and use this green marker. And I'm going to uh, keep in mind here I'm going to go ahead and use this gray marker and keep in mind, I'm going to choose top and left. That's probably my favorite for shading. So now I'm going to very carefully start out by shading the top, the top, the top, and finish shading the left, the left, and the left of this letter. And suddenly, that letter pops off the page and gives me a 3D effect with not a whole lot of work. All right, moving into what we call faux calligraphy. Faux calligraphy is a starting point for you to use, to use your own basic cursive. So think back to elementary school when we learned our cursive letters. You also sign your names that way and many of you write that way regularly. I'm going to start by just writing the word joy. Now however you write the word joy is completely irrelevant to making this technique work. Once you have your letter or your word written out, all you're going to do is to go over it in your mind once and then go over it with a pen a second time. Now, why do we do this? The reason we want to do this is that letters have what we call upstrokes and downstrokes. And if we do this without thinking through it first, a lot of times we end up frustrated and with mistakes. What we want to accomplish is a double down. I'll write that down so you don't forget. Double down means every downstroke needs to be a double thick line. We go up, we go down, we go up and down, up, down, down, and up. Okay, so if I'm tracing in my mind, I will have kind of planned out where I'm going and then I can come back easily and recognize those downstrokes starting with this first part of the J. Now once I have that downstroke there, the double downstroke, I can fill this in. Now I could also leave it hollow and use color, but I like to really make you believe that I've done this beautiful artwork. Calligraphy is used with a slanted tipped pen. And now with the um, fad of hand lettering, we have beautiful markers like this dual tip from Tombow that lets us paint like a brush pen. But the beauty of calligraphy comes with the thick and the thin lines. The upstrokes are the thin and the downstrokes are the thick. Let me go ahead and finish this for you right where we're at. Now, although the top of this O starts out with an upstroke, ultimately it's a downstroke. So we're going to hit this up a little here. Same with this little curve in the O. A part of this side of the Y and of course, the long part of this part of the Y. So with just a little extra work, I can really bring some beautiful emphasis to my basic handwriting 
but make it look extra special and as if I had all sorts of talent. Now, what if these letters stick... Now, what if hand lettering is something you just don't want to fuss with or it's just not your thing? There's all sorts of alpha stickers. You can find them in all shapes and sizes like you see on the picture here. Big, bold block letters, small, whimsical letters in all different varieties of colors, even shapes. This one here has kind of a raised edge to it. You can see by the front of this one, I got this one on sale. And this is what I recommend to always look for things that are on sale. Alpha stickers are a great example of that. Stickers and stamps are often on sale in our craft stores and it's a great time to make a very small investment, but also gives you some variety when you're going to finish a page. All right, as we continue in this section together on practicing and finding some new ideas and ways to improve our own natural ability and skills, I want to work with you on our next section on visualization. On your worksheet, you're going to notice not only a small grid at the bottom of your paper, but also a place where it says your word is. So I'd like to reveal to you, as you may have guessed by the picture, your word is grow. Now, once you've written down your word, what we're going to do together is to write down anything that comes to our mind. This is a practice that I often use when I'm Bible journaling. Once I read through a passage of scripture and understand the content, the next thing I do is start to look for key words in the, in the part of the verse or the concept that I really want to focus my attention on. It is very easy to want to just jump right in with the first thing we see. Grow means what? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the word grow? Is it some sort of a plant? A little seedling? A tree? Let's go beyond our basic first response to this. I did this practice with the word light. I challenged my guests to think of the first thing that came to mind and almost everyone chooses a light bulb or some sort of a lighting fixture. But as we took time to visualize and explore all of the possibilities, we ended up with a resource filled with images we could use to represent it. If you notice in your chart, you'll see the word that it says sources of the word. So where specifically do we see grow? I might think about it as uh, my children, the growth that my children have had. I may, of course, think of plants or different kinds of flowers. I also might think of a balloon that as I blow air into, it expands and gets bigger. I might think of a fire when the air hits the fire or the wood hits the fire, it continues to grow and get larger and larger. What about a baby in the belly <laughs> growing and growing and growing? These would be sources of the word grow. I'm excited to see what you come up with. Pause the video and take a few moments to either write down the words or small sketches like these to help you think about the most creative version of the word grow. All right, the next section asks you to think about synonyms for the word. This would mean coming up with different words that mean the same thing. For instance, the word increase. What about the word expand? By thinking of some of the synonyms that have the same basic principle of understanding, you might then relate with more images, things that are different than what you've already developed over here. Next, I want you to think about the feelings that this word provokes. Grow is a hard one. There may not be feelings. Maybe there's colors. Maybe there's seasons 
or maybe there is um, activity or action related. When you expand your categories of how you can view a word, it allows you to create a better visualization or a pot of images that you can go from. The reason that I like doing this um, activity and I think it's super beneficial is because when you're giving um, yourself to God's word, you want to connect with the images as much as you do the words. Don't just draw a generic flower just because you couldn't think of something else. Try to expand your thinking by an exercise like this one to put as much out there as you possibly can. It's just a giant brainstorm. Even consider the following. What complements this word? Or what is the opposite of this word? Well, for growth, we could also see death. That might be the approach that you take, the opposing approach to how you present the page based on what the scripture is saying. This is a super easy technique that you can use when you first get started and you don't know what image to come up with. Now let's talk about the dilemmas because I know what you're saying right now. You're saying, Monica, I can't draw those things. I can't sketch those things out. That's not the point. What the point is, is to give yourself a brainstorm of images because now when you go to find an image, you can go to the internet, you can look for stickers or stamps or resources that maybe tell your story for you. This may be the most fun part of this video series where I get to dive in with some of these materials and really help you make decisions about how to get started. We'll look at a few examples of different ways you can start basic pages. And that's really my goal today is to hit up some of the big supplies that we use over and over again to create soft, subtle backgrounds of color. Pages that aren't overwhelming and then allow you to expand with your own creativity. Let's start with watercolor washes. With watercolor, there are all sorts of varieties. This is one of my go-tos. As messy as it is, I love Angora watercolors. They're pretty inexpensive, and usually you can find them in sets with multiple colors. You can see this has been very well loved. There are also really exciting sets of metallic colors, but if you do choose a metallic paint, it is smart for you to make an investment of a good quality. You want to make sure that the metallic doesn't overbear the actual color of the material. Okay, so you can either use a regular brush and water, old-fashioned watercolor, okay, so just like I have here. Or you can invest in a water brush where the water stays right inside of the brush and it gives you usually some a different set of tips, but the water will just kind of squeeze out and be able to help you paint as you go. One thing you want to think about when you're doing a simple watercolor wash is to choose colors that are going to react happily together. I always suggest to my newbies that it's really smart to invest in a color wheel. Green is very closely related to blue, but it could also go in the other direction towards yellow. I think that's what I'm going to do with this one. I'm not as worried about my colors mixing. In fact, I kind of want them to do that. So one of the most basic ways to get color quickly on your page and not have to worry too much about what happens is to just use what's called washes of watercolor. That means we're using a pretty decent amount of water and we're just kind of blobbing the colors on in different spaces. You'll notice I'm kind of using like as if this was like a puzzle. I'm just kind of adding pieces here and there. I'm looking for different tones throughout, and if I want to darken things up, I would just go ahead and go into another uh, deeper, richer color. I could even go as far over as blue, because as, as you may know, blue and yellow make, that's right, you've guessed it, green. So now that I have just a little bit of color on my page throughout, I can let this dry, or I could sprinkle a little bit of salt and set it to the side so it has a textured effect. And when this dries, I'm going to be ready to journal in no time. All I really need to do is to put on some text, maybe a sticker or two, and I've got a page in under 10 minutes. Another simple page starter that I love, love, love 
is using either gelatos, scribble sticks, or distressed crayons. I'm going to show you all three. These are distressed crayons. They are from Tim Holtz or Ranger materials. Pretty much all just a paint stick, a water-based paint stick, but there are a few advantages. When you water these down, you can thin them out almost as thin as a watercolor. The difference between a distressed crayon and the gelato is that the gelato, even when watered down, tends to have a bit of a film and may ruin your pen when you write over it. That's one advantage to the distressed crayons. Now, oftentimes when I use these materials, I will actually put my text on the page first and then use this as kind of a background. But I'm going to show you how to get started with a really simple page and then show you how to lift some of the material off the page in order to allow yourself writing space. One of my favorite things to do with gelatos is to use stencils. But before I put my stencil down, I want to give this a little base of color. I'll start here with my blue. And I just realized I forgot to show you the scribble sticks. This is also a water soluble pigment crayon. These are all three products, very similar, just different makers. So if you noticed, some people will go right to their page with the, the paint stick and then try to blend it in and you won't be as successful as you'll want. Unless you want something to look kind of chunky and like you could see the strokes, I suggest putting it right onto a sponge like this little guy here and then using small circles to go around and add that base of color. The difference, as I'll show you, is if I color directly on there, yes, there is you know, a little more pigment and you can get those nice streaks if you want them, but if you're trying to have it be smooth, a lot of times it'll be a little bit pesty. That actually worked pretty well, but sometimes it can be a little bit pesty and it won't blend in and that causes frustration. Now, another thing that you need to know about these materials, these gelatos or paint sticks, water soluble pigments, is that they're exactly that, they're water soluble. So if you are to do work over the top of them with water, you're going to lift them and they're going to move around. So be careful about your choices that way. So now what I can do is lay over a stencil. I just wanna create this beautiful background. And I think what I'll do here is actually come in with a stronger green. So something that's just a little bit different from my background, but not too far off. And then I'm just going to use kind of a twisting motion. A lot of times when you do stencil work like this, especially with gelatos or distressed crayons, it's very tempting. Uh, it's, well, I shouldn't say tempting, but it looks like you're not really doing a whole lot of anything. I've noticed that many times where I thought, man, is there any color coming off? But once you lift it up, you'll start to see what your design is. And if you're not happy with it, all you'll be able to do is to lay this back down because you'll see your lines, add more color or a different tone, and then you can get a more dramatic effect. I'm going to go back and add a little bit of the blue and bring that blue back out. Go ahead and twist, add a little bit more, and then you'll be all set. So now that I have kind of a subtle background to start with, I've got color on my page and that's a success. That makes us feel less intimidated than the white page, oftentimes. Now, what if I wanted to maybe work here in the middle? What I can do is either use a baby wipe or just wet a small piece of towel Make sure most of the water is squeezed out. And then you can just kind of wipe away the area that you wanna work in. So now I've lessened the pigment here. I've, I've kind of removed some of that material. This will also work with your stencil. You can lay a stencil down over a very richly pigmented page and pick the material back up. This is another great page starter for you. All right, I'm set up here to do two more page starters for you. On one side, we're going to work with chalk pastels and torn paper. And on the other side, we're going to use a credit card with some acrylic paint. So let's go ahead and get started over here with our chalk pastels. Now, I love to use torn paper and chalk pastels to make all sorts of different effects. Especially this works great if you're looking to do something that kind of represents a landscape. I am using uh, these pan pastels, which are very, very rich in pigment. You can see how bright they are. They're amazing. They are a little bit messy, and I prefer to use chalks 
uh, chalk sticks perhaps when I am uh, doing this technique, but these are definitely doable. And if you were to have a pan pastel, something like what I have here, you would just want to make sure that you have some sort of a, either a piece of tissue or I have this big fluff ball, big pom-pom that I'm going to use. So what I'm going to do here is actually just start at the bottom of the page. I don't really have a plan, so I'm just going to go for it. Get some of my color and start to brush it off the top. And then as I move up the page, or I can move down the page, whichever it is, I can either just stick with one color and let them kind of overlap, just like this, to create some really cool effects. Or I can mix and match. So let's go ahead and put in here, I'm actually gonna flip this the other direction to give myself, uh, I do suggest that if you're trying to make kind of like a mountain or just, just for some variety, to switch your torn piece of paper or create several pieces of torn paper as you work up. This is a really easy thing to do. You could also do this over some washi tape. We'll, look, we'll talk about washi tape here in just a moment, but just know that that is a really fun effect. The only dilemma that you may run into with using chalks in your Bible is the rub off from one page to the other. So what I like to do is either give it a really light spray of a fixative or even just a cheap hairspray works great. But you can also add a piece of vellum or a plain piece of paper in between the Bible pages and that's going to allow you to not have that dust falling off onto the other side. On this side, let's go ahead and look at credit card painting. It's a technique that a lot of our ladies love to have fun with. This is great for painted prayers or for faith artists as well. So what you're going to do is to grab yourself a credit card and also some varieties of acrylic paint. Now I'm using just an inexpensive craft paint today and I've got three different colors. Now this is one of those places where you're going to want some sort of a craft mat or piece of paper uh, behind to kind of protect the pages behind it. What we simply do is to just start with a couple of little dots of color right on the edge, like kind of like what we did in our gesso um, during our first video when we were doing our napkin pages. Just this little tiny bit on our, on our credit card and we're gonna use it just smearing across the page and of course you can have all sorts of fun. This one doesn't wanna come out for me here. Hold on one second. You can have all sorts of fun with mixing your colors. Again, this is another place for that color wheel to come in handy. And you know, putting something on there that's kind of unexpected is not such a bad deal. This is a very forgiving technique and it's a lot of fun to do. So I've got my three dots. That was, it's, it looked pretty painful, wasn't it? It did, took a long time to get those three dots. And what I'll do here is just kind of play right off the side of my paper. Look at how fun that is. I love that shot of red. Now I could use uh, something just really big and simple and let these colors just play off of each other, which I think I will in this case. Or I could continue to streak over with different colors or different tones and build up a lot of coverage. You can see though, by using a credit card, you can still have a very similar effect as we did with our watercolor paint where you can still actually read through. If you like a thicker painted pictures, then this would be the time for you to be able to go in there with a brush or just go over it with some different layers to break up the paint. All right, there's a couple more things I'd like to show you here during our uh, tips and tricks now that we've accomplished a few page starters. And one of those things is what to do with washi tape. So let's go ahead and open up my Bible here. I've been working in this Bible for a couple of years now and we'll find washi peppered throughout. These two pages, what I did here is I actually used the washi to line the edge of the page. It creates a really cool effect when the Bible is closed and oftentimes there are certain washies that catch my eye and remind me of what page is underneath. Another place that I often use washi or occasionally use washi is in my marker tabs. And we're actually gonna talk about how to make tabs in just a few minutes. But using a simple piece of washi just folded over on itself on the end of a paper clip is a great way to give yourself some really inexpensive tabs. 
Another place to use washi is where we saw our tippins. Now I'm going to show you a couple of different varieties of tippins. This one here was actually tipped into the inside. This is a clear sheet that I did some work on, uh, painted and markered and stickered on, and I taped it within the page so it actually acts as a part of the Bible. Another page uh, that I did back here uses the tippin. Let me get my Bible in, in, in uh, site for you here, is at the bottom of the page. So being able to take this tip in and actually, I think I have it taped in there so it didn't get caught, but this would actually come out and I could finish reading that section as this well. This is a pretty extreme page. This was my washi quilt and yes, every single one of these little squares and designs was cut by me um, with an X-Acto blade. But the cool thing is, is I chose different size washies and there is a full tutorial on our website for doing a quilt just like this. I hope you take that challenge because it's really well worth it. It's one of my favorite pages in my Bible. And of course, don't forget to use washi as part of the art. I used them across the page here on my margin just to create a difference of design flags. The cool thing about washi is they come in all sorts of sizes and design colors. So there's a lot of fun added to a page when you stick some washi on it. So the next thing I want to talk about here is really simple. It's when to gesso and what are the worst bleeders. The worst bleeders, that's the stuff that you use on your page that bleeds through to the back, just like this one here. If you see on the front, this is a beautiful page created with all sorts of color, yet the only thing you really see on the back is the black. Now why is that? In this page, I used stamps, and with my rubber stamping ink, it doesn't seem to matter which variety I choose, black ink wants to bleed through the paper. So what's the solution? Gesso. The same gesso that we use for applying napkins can be used to coat pages where you think that a material may bleed through. You don't need it for watercolor or acrylic, but you would if you're going to watercolor a background and then stamp over the top. So think through your page before you get started and decide if prepping is worth it for you. Now I tend to take an approach of whatever I did on the backside can probably be fixed on the front. And sometimes this is just all a part of the journey. It's seeing some of these types of mistakes. They're not to lose sleep over, but instead to grow from and to learn. Hopefully though, by understanding that concept that ink likes to bleed. Ink for stamping or really heavy marker inks are the two, the two main culprits for any bleed through. If you're really heavy handed, some of your ink pens might do the same or if you color over something a few times. So just be careful to think through your process, what do you need in order to be successful and to prevent bleed through as much as possible. I want to show you three of my Bibles. I've talked about them a little bit here and there, but they're great examples of the different varieties you can find. One of the first questions someone asks is, what Bible do I need to get? The question is really up to you, and hopefully today's workshop really helped you to decide what your approach to creative worship will be, and if you'll even use the Bible at all. This is a small version of a journaling Bible. It's really quite a small pocket size. I mean, not really pocket size, but it is less than a, a, a normal book or a normal Bible. The advantage is it's small and can, I can take it anywhere and not feel like I'm lugging something around, but it does limit you in your spacing of your margins. Things tend to need to be a little bit on the smaller side. This is also what's called a double column Bible. So what we have here is two columns of text and one column for writing. Keep that in mind when we go to look at our next Bible. I think that the Bible itself is bigger, but what I really want you to take a look at is what the inside difference looks like. The text is easier to read because it's just one larger column of writing or text, and then you end up with a longer skinny margin. The last Bible I want to take a look at is my very favorite. Personally, I love to create full pages of artwork, but I'm always wanting to use my Bible. And so one of the things that I really loved about this particular Bible was the idea that I had a full page to create and a full page to study, to create, to write notes, to take, um, to do my micro journaling on, and they didn't need to interfere. 
This Bible is very large. If you look at it, it's very thick. That's because there's so many extra pages interleaved in between. And that's exactly what this Bible is called, the interleaved Bible. I highly recommend it if you love doing full-paged art. Now, where would you find some of these Bibles for the best price? My go-to is christianbooks.com. One of the fun things about uh, doing Bible journaling is the Bible bling. We have all sorts of fun with additions, ways to mark our pages, and that includes something as easy as a date stamper. Remember these things? Uh, they have all sorts of fancy ones now with different sayings, but you can move the date around and just document your pages that way. I like doing that because it definitely helps me when I go back to see where I was in that time and where God has brought me. You can also use things like embroidery, uh, little appliques, or even stickers hot glued to a paper clip. There's many that you can buy in the store. This one happens to be metal. You can use ribbon or washi tape or even make some giant pom-poms. I'm also going to show you here this nice investment. This is a puncher for tabs. And I love this because it allows me to use all of my extra scrapbook paper up and to create just the perfect size tab that I can then glue on with a glue stick. I recommend the Zig glue stick for this. And it just, it just goes right in here between the pages and then I'm able to mark or use little alpha stickers to make my mark. Lastly, I'd like to show you how to put together a ribbon uh, paper clip. It's super easy. So what we're going to do is fold our ribbon in half and we're going to look at our paper clip. There's two loops and one. We want to be on the end with the one. So this ribbon loop is going to go in the single side loop and we're going to open this up as we feed it through. Once it's open, we're going to stick the two ends through that loop and pull it tight. Now it's going to be on the end of my paper clip and I can use that to tag my next page. Well, congratulations, you have made it to the very last segment of video three, which means you're just seconds away from finishing our course here on creative worship. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed being a part of this process with you. I want you to know though, that we aren't going anywhere. In fact, we invite you to become part of our regular community. We have so much to offer you and I hope that you'll check out your work page that you have in front of you about all the different avenues for you to plug in. Whether you join us at a retreat or a workshop, whether you find us regularly week to week on Facebook, or whether you take the plunge and be a part of our membership, which is a $20 a month investment that's good for both you and us. Not only do you have access to a very top secret resource vault put together with love and care each month by our team of coaches, you'll also have the good feeling of knowing that your contribution is helping to keep this ministry going and providing you all sorts of resources like this one and the free ones that we have available to you on the web. But what we pray for you as you leave this journey more than any of those things I've mentioned before is that you will fall madly in love with God's word the way that our team has. We hope that if this resonates with you and that you feel inspired and encouraged and excited to get going, we pray that God's word gets tucked deep inside your heart, that it comes out in all areas of your life, and that this little tool, this hook, to using creative experiences with his word will be what really sets you apart, what really bumps you forward in your spiritual journey. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here as your guide and for taking the commitment to trying our course out. We'd love to hear from you some feedback. Make sure that you email us at info at the We'd love to hear your experiences and see some of the things that you've created today with us. Be sure to speak up and say hello when you join us for a live or take part in one of our activities. We'd love to know that you're there enjoying all that God has given us and blessed us with here at The Bright Bible. Thanks so much. Best of luck to you. And as always, happy journaling.